if you could see me, you would know that I live with anxiety and depression. Mostly anxiety. All the anxiety. All the time. I like to say that I live life in caps lock. <laughs> Just like this, all the time. <laughs> you can't tell because they would lock me up if I walked around like that. So this is what I look like. You've never seen a person get so overwhelmed by the task of simply trying to organize a pile of papers. Because there are so many options of how this pile of papers could be filed away. So the pile remains, and I just go over here and ignore it. <sighs> Living with anxiety is like the world is constantly telling you that you're not enough, that you don't know where to find your place, that you shake no matter what you're doing, you're shaking. And I have had to learn how to find my way in the world in the midst of the reality that exists inside of my body. I show up every day with all the tools that I have at my disposal, and I give my all. And sometimes it's enough and other times it's not. When I was a child, I was afraid of everything. I didn't sleep between the ages of seven and 18. I was afraid that I was going to be kidnapped in the middle of the night. I was afraid that I would be taken away. I was afraid that demons would possess me in the middle of the night. I would afraid, was afraid that my dolls would come to life. The only people who made me feel safe, the most safe in the world, were my grandparents, my Bubby and Zeta. They knew how to tell a story. They taught me the love of stories. They taught me to laugh in the midst of life's most challenging circumstances. When I was 13 years old, my Bubby told me uh, that when my Zeta was about the same age as I was then, he began to feel there was something off with his mental health. Only, it was the late 1930s, that's them, and they didn't know what mental health was back then. But he was a kid, so he went to his mother, because that's what we do. We go to our parents or the adults that we trust in our lives in hopes that they will guide and support and nurture us in our uncertainty. But my great-grandmother was a Ukrainian Jewish immigrant, expelled from her country by virtue of existing on the world as a Jewish person. So she was fearful. She was sick herself. So she told him to keep his mouth shut. They'll put you away, she said. And he believed her. He got the message that the person he was, the person he really was, wasn't good enough, wasn't worthy of help, wasn't worthy of the love and the care that he needed. And I know that she did that out of fear and out of love, but she sent him a message. And it would be 15 years before he received a schizophrenia diagnosis that he carried with him for the rest of his life. His ultimate savior protector, partner, and defender was my puppy. Shortly after they were married, his uh, symptoms could no longer be avoided. But when he got the diagnosis, her family and his encouraged her to institutionalize him, put him away. It was 1952, and that's what you did in 1952. You hoped no one found out that you had one of those people in your family. For us, the diagnosis was never a secret. We knew 
who our Zeta was. That sometimes he was erratic, sometimes he was weird, but he was also loving and kind and funny and warm. And he was ours, so his life had meaning. They would have had, him, had us believe that beyond a schizophrenia diagnosis, there was no meaning. But I know that they still felt the need to hide. I know that now. Because you see, when you grow up in the midst of amazing people, you don't know that you're growing up in the midst of amazing people. They're just your people. I was almost 30 years old before I realized the weight of, of what they carried. When I was almost 30 years old, I started working in the mental health and disability support services field. And I started listening to people, to self-advocates, to family advocates, stand up and tell their stories over and over and over again. And it made me realize how much my grandparents, my family, had been forced to hide. And I made it my mission, without even really realizing it, that no 13-year-old child, if I had anything to do with it, no child would ever have to hide again. Through the process of learning how to be a self-advocate, I came in contact with so many others who I asked to share their photographs with me because they brought me here and they are on this stage with me tonight. They are incredibly brave, beautiful people who stand up every day and advocate for the rights of the people that they love. And after hearing it and seeing it for so long, I decided that it was time for me to get brave, and it was time for me to start telling my story. I've always been a performer, a singer, a writer, an actor, and so I showed up with the skills that I had at my disposal, and I wrote this little show called It Runs in the Family. I wrote, and I spoke, and I sang, and I told, and eventually I started inviting other people to come up, and the responses that I got were so unbelievably amazing and surprising that I, I couldn't stop. I, I became addicted to the process of doing this because I thought everybody knew how freeing, how powerful it makes you feel when you stand up and you share the lived experience of your life with the world. But they don't know. <laughs> and so I'm working with all of these amazing people to to tell the world, to say it's okay. We are all broken in some form or fashion. <laughs> and it's okay. So I wrote the show and I wrote a book. And last year, I started this new project with a group of unbelievably amazing, brave, beautiful people. This is one of the pictures. It's called If You Could See Me. And it came out of the blue in, an, in a, a bout of synesthesia in the shower because that's where all the best ideas are born. <laughs> right? So I saw hashtag If You Could See Me in front of my eyes as clear as day, and I knew that this was the next project. This was the thing that we were going to do. And it wasn't going to be mine. It was going to be ours. And I called my amazing friend, a photographer in Richmond, Virginia, where I live, Dean Whitbeck. And I said, this is the project that we're going to do. You're going to take our pictures with your beautiful eye, and you're going to tell our stories in that way. And we are going to stand up in front of a room full of strangers and family and friends and whoever else will listen, and we're going to tell our stories in our own way. We're going to share our experiences as adults living with a mental health diagnosis. But the thing is, is that this doesn't have to be limited to mental health or to disability services. This is all of us standing up in front of the world and saying, I'm okay exactly the way that I am. But that's a really hard and scary thing to do. It's hard to admit our flaws because we live in a world that wants us to be perfect all the time. So 
I have come here with a challenge for you this evening that I would like for you to consider. I want you to start out by thinking about a moment when you were sad, when you were disappointed, when you were afraid, when you were angry, when you let yourself down, when you let another person down. I want you to think about that time. And I want you to leave tonight, and I want you to go home and I want you to write the story of that incident. But before you do that, I want you to internalize I ask you to internalize the following statements. One, humor is healing. When we can find something to laugh at in our most challenging, most painful situations, we take control over it. It no longer has power over us. Two, this is a secret. Not one person on the entire earth was born with an instruction manual. Nobody knows what the hell they're doing. <laughs> and as a result, number three, you're not alone. Number four, you are allowed to like yourself, even though you're not perfect. That seems like a really simple thing that is really hard for us to internalize. Number five, I think. <laughs> Imperfect beauty of imperfection, right? Number five is you are allowed to be proud of yourself, even though you've made mistakes. And number six, probably most importantly, your story can change the world. No matter how boring, how mundane, how uneventful you think your life is, if you are able to share your story with the world and you are able to change one person's perspective, one person's idea about who they are and what they're capable of, then you have changed the world. If a butter... <laughs> Thank you. If a butterfly's wings flapping can cause a typhoon, then we can change the world with our stories. When we learn compassion, when we stand next to one another and share the truth, of what it's like to live on the planet. That's all there is. That's all there is. So I ask you to think about your story. I ask you to share it. It's yours. That's the great thing. It's your story. And you get to share it however you want. You get to say it in whatever fashion or form you are inspired to do it. It's yours. All I ask is that you, you love your story. You hold your story in your heart and then go out and share it with the world.